Hello. Um. Okay, there's a couple people here. <laughs> um. I hope everyone else is having an extended Thanksgiving weekend. <laughs> um. Uh. So I, uh, I, I mean, for people who are here or people who uh, are watching this, I did um, finally put up the midterm assignments last night. So um, except for a few where there's uh, special issues or whatever, but they're they're almost all up with the grades now. So you can look at those if you haven't already. Um. All right, I'm just going to start talking about Kuhn, I guess. Um, so these are his dates. He died in 1996. Popper also died in 1996. Um, I or anyway, around the same time that Kuhn died. And I remember my roommate at the time saying that, uh, speculating that there might be some alien civilization where the planet is ruled by philosophers of science and they were planning to invade us. So they thought they would kill off our top philosophers of science first. All right. Anyway, um, uh, so just a little bit in general about Kuhn, um, he was, and to some extent, he remains something of an outsider in philosophy. Um, all his degrees up through his PhD were in physics. Um, and he switched to, and it wasn't even clear, I mean, whether he was switching to history of, philosophy, history of science or philosophy of science or both, but he did it kind of on his own. Um, so he he did end up, you know, teaching in various prestigious places. First he was in Berkeley and then uh, Princeton and then MIT. Um, but my impression is that in all of those places he was never completely part of the culture. Um, and to this day in philosophy, so this is kind of similar to something I said about Popper, only the contrast audience is different. Um, in some areas outside of philosophy, I believe that even now Kuhn is seen as like uh, um, an important figure to be uh, like an authority, you know, as Kuhn says, paradigm, blah, blah, blah. Um, but uh, only I think it's not as in Popper's case, like physical scientists who will refer to his ideas, perhaps in a superficial way, but at least will refer to them. It's maybe more social scientists of certain certain areas. But within philosophy, I think that he's, um, you know, with exceptions. But I my impression that he's mostly regarded as kind of a problem to deal with, and the problem that there is to deal with is the problem of continuity of concepts through scientific progress or something like that. Um, so, um, that's not exactly the way I'm going to be presenting Kuhn. We'll, we'll see where that problem comes in, but I'm going to be claiming that's not really the most important thing, actually. Um, all right. Um, so are there any questions about Kuhn, generally speaking? I don't know anything. I tried to find out at some point, tried to find out something about his politics. Um, and I was not able to find out anything interesting. Um, but there may be an explanation for that, which I may come back to later. 
other than that, if you ask me any more questions about Kuhn, I probably don't know the answer. <laughs> um, okay, so, um, so why is this book in the popper half of the course, right? Remember, there's like two parts of the course. There's the Carnap Goodman Quine part, and there's the popper Kuhn part, basically. Um, so it's a little odd because Kuhn actually says, um, he says this in a footnote in his contribution to that Popper philosophy of Karl Popper volume that we keep getting stuff from. So Kuhn contributed to that too. And in a footnote near the beginning, he says that he had read nothing by Popper until the logic of scientific discovery appeared in English in 1959. Um, and that by that time, the structure of scientific revolutions was already, quote unquote, in draft. Um, um, but he said that he had been familiar with some of Popper's ideas from um, hearing people talk about them, and in particular, that he had attended lectures that Popper gave at Harvard in 1950. Um, and in any case, it's clear that that draft was revised at least a little bit because in the current version, this is on page 146 through 147, there's actually a discussion, it's a brief discussion of Popper with a footnote to the logic of scientific discovery. Um, so, uh, you know, um, it's a little ambiguous, but let's say that you know, it's at least not clear that, that Kuhn meant this book in any specific way as a response to Popper. Um, but nevertheless, what kind of view of, what kind of received views about the nature of science is this book a response to or an attack on? Um, well, I mean, it's not a response to some theory about what it is that makes statements cognitively meaningful. Um, right, such that, um, you know, we would be answering a big question that's supposed to cover what we call the mature, what we call sciences, or what Kuhn and a lot of other people in this period called the mature sciences, like the physical sciences, life sciences. But it's supposed to cover anything that we don't want to rule out as nonsense, right? I mean, remember, that's what Carnap is trying to define in the Aufbau. So just like ordinary things, like there's a table here, uh, but also parts of sciences that are not quote unquote mature, but that we don't consider to be nonsense, like psychology or, uh, you know, um, anthropology, even sociology is not nonsense, maybe. <laughs> no, I mean, it's not, not all nonsense. There might be some nonsense in it, but uh, there might be some nonsense in philosophy more. Anyway, be that as it may. Uh, so, um, Right. Uh, and not only that, but various things that make some claim to being science, even if we, didn't really, we don't really think they're right, but they're not meaningless, like astrology or something. Right. Like uh, the question about how do we get empirically legitimate concepts? How do we identify them? How do we tell when a statement uses them or not? Like that type of question that Carnap and Goodman and Quine are talking about is a very broad question. Um, and this book is not a response to that. At least it's not mostly a response to that. Sometimes Kuhn says things about the nature of perception in general, and it's often a question how to relate that to the view, the main views of the book. But um, for the most part, this book is a response to some kind of received answer to the demarcation problem, right? To what Popper calls the demarcation problem. Um, and in particular to a question about how um, 
the demarcation problem can be uh, resolved by referring not to the contents of scientists' belief, but to what scientists actually do. The questions that at least Popper wants to include in methodology. Right, so near the very beginning, um, and I'm going to use this PDF version of the book that I have rather than using the document camera. Um, right, he talks about how um, there's an older practice in the history of science that uh, kind of like regards it as a history of errors except for the parts that lead up to our current view. Um, but then he says, look, if you, you know, if you look into the things actually that Aristotelian people believed in Aristotelian dynamics, by which he means the theory of impulse in the later Middle Ages, I guess, or phlogistic chemistry or caloric thermodynamics. He said, if you look into what these people were doing, you'll see that they weren't doing things that were really that different from what current scientists do. And then the conclusion, if these out-of-date beliefs are to be called myths, then myths can be produced by the same sort of methods and held for the same sort of reasons that now lead to scientific knowledge. If, on the other hand, they are to be called science, then science has included bodies of belief quite incompatible with the ones we hold today. Given these alternatives, the historian must choose the latter. Right? So the, for the historian to choose the latter means um, for the historian to choose as an answer to the demarcation problem, not what counts as science is people who believe correct things, but what counts as science is people who do something right, even if, you know, um, for whatever reason, doing the right thing didn't lead them to what we think of as a correct conclusion. So, um, so the topic of study here is going to be science in the sense of people, or as he always says, men. I may say a little bit more about that in the future, but I mean, it's not like everyone writing in English, even in the 80s, you'll see, you know, you'll see them unselfconsciously using this kind of uh, um, gender exclusive language. But maybe it's just because of Kuhn's writing style. I don't know what it is, but it seems like really a constant drumbeat of men, men, men in this book. Um, so I, anyway, like I said, I might say something about that later, but I'm going to not say more about it now. I'm just, I'm going to say people. So the, the, like what we're looking at is the people who do the kind of things that we call science. Um, uh, and that's the same general question that Popper is asking. Um, So before I get into the details of that, though, I mean, first of all, is what I said just clear clear now? Are there questions, those who are here, about why I'm thinking of Kuhn, whether he, even though he may not be that aware of it himself in 1959 or even 1962, I'm thinking of Kuhn basically as a response to Popper's project of philosophy of science, not Carnap's. Makes sense. Well, thank you. <laughs>
<laughs> I guess. <laughs> um, right. So uh, before getting into the details of this, though, I do want to raise one general, really important question about Kuhn, which um, we're not in a position to answer now, but I think is worth keeping in mind as you read it, so, which is whether his theory, um, if it can be called that, or anyway, his approach is meant to apply to the field that he himself is in, whatever that is. And as I said, it's unclear whether it's history of science or philosophy of science, um, or both. Um, uh, I think historians of science often will tell you that uh, Kuhn's history isn't really reliable, but the philosophy is interesting. And philosophers of science will often tell you the opposite. <laughs> anyway, be that as it may. Um, so, you know, is his approach supposed to apply to his own field? Right? In other words, is his description of what makes science work the way it is and how it changes through revolutions and whatever supposed to apply to the intellectual endeavor that he himself is involved in? Um, and um, we'll see that he sometimes at least strongly hints that it is. So that, for example, we might we would want to see this book as his attempt to introduce a new paradigm into that field, whatever field that is. Um, I mean, you can kind of see that if you look carefully, even, uh, you know, if you go back to the beginning of chapter one and see how he describes, you know, we're in the grip of a certain image and what has to happen to change it and it won't happen right away and you know all these things he says about scientific revolutions um, however on the other hand uh, there's good reason to think that it shouldn't apply because after all history of science or philosophy of science are those mature sciences according to Kuhn I mean he doesn't even and what the scale is here from, you know, more mature to less mature, I don't, well, what the scale is here that, that Kuhn and, and Carnap and Popper and others think can be um, explained as a scale from more mature to less mature, um, I don't know that that analysis is right, but there seems to be some scale there, right? So that you can say even, and the sentence I was going to say is, he doesn't even think psychology is a mature science, let alone philosophy, <laughs> right? Um, so, uh, um, so there's a puzzle about that. Um, one possible answer is that he's trying to establish the first paradigm and make this field a mature science, but there's also reasons to wonder about that. So anyway, I just want to raise that possibility before I go on. Now let me talk more about the details of what happens in the first part of the book. Um, so, um, I mean, there's really, I think, although Kuhn doesn't emphasize this, there's really two parts to what he's responding to here. Um, and could say, you know, there's the old picture of scientific progress. And then, and this he discusses pretty explicitly. And then there's Popper's alternative, which he doesn't discuss mentioning Popper by name. I mean, he knows some people who are part of Popper's school, so to speak, like Fire, Paul Feyerabend uh, and probably others as well. Um, so maybe he doesn't even identify this specifically with Popper, but um, but basically, you know, the the way this works is that he and Popper, or 
Popperians both think this can't be right. Um, but Kuhn rejects this answer as well, right? And then, so then there's Kuhn's view. So the old picture is the picture of what he calls development by accumulation. And this is, you know, basically the same thing that um, that Popper put in the mouths of inductivists as their explanation of scientific progress. Um, as more and more data come in, we have to make progress, well, barring some kind of improbable catastrophe, right? Like starting tomorrow, all the data, do, you know, go against everything we've got up till now. But barring something like that, which according to inductivists uh, is very improbable. So, you know, as more data come in, we have to get better um, because, um, you know, um, the theories we have that have been correctly formed by induction will probably get more and more probable. Um, at least if they're overthrown, it will only be because they've been shown to be a special case of a more general theory. And in the meantime, as the specific theories get more and more probable, the general theory gets more and more general. Again, because we have more data. Um, right, so that's how the process of the progress of science is expected to happen. And that's the kind of progress Kuhn says that historians of science have been looking for until recently. And so they ask, you know, who discovered oxygen? That's an interesting question because, you know, as data came in, <laughs> uh, at some point there were enough data to discover oxygen and someone did that. And now we know that there's oxygen, right? That's development by accumulation. Now, I mean, if you ask them, wait, but didn't they also discover things that we don't believe exist anymore, like caloric, right? Caloric was supposed to be, uh, I think I mentioned this before in one context or another, but anyway, caloric was supposed to be uh, heat understood as a, as a fluid that flows, you know, that gathers in hot things and flows from hot things to cold things. And that is supposed to explain the um, phenomena that we explain by thermodynamics, right? But I mean, it turns out there is no such fluid. That is, those, those phenomena can't be explained by assuming there's a fluid called heat whose quantity is conserved. Um, so there is no such thing as caloric. Um, and uh, so caloric was never discovered, according to this point of view, that is not legitimately discovered. But then you say, but wait, everyone believed in it. And the answer has to be, well, that was a mistake. Right? They misinterpreted the data that had already come in, or they reached some conclusion that wasn't uh, justified by the data that had come in, and they leapt to some conclusion that was wrong, um, and they shouldn't have done that. And so that was just like a dead end um, path that some people unfortunately got onto. Um, Right, and again, Kuhn and Popper agree in rejecting this old picture. Now, so, I mean, by the way, so Popper is, is implicitly attributing this picture to Carnap, but according to my, like, organization of things, Carnap isn't exactly interested in this question. Um, um, I mean, he is and he isn't. I'll say a little bit more about that later. But um, but anyway, Kuhn and Popper agree 
that this can't be the right view of scientific progress. And for the same reason, they look at what previous scientists did and they see that they um, reached erroneous conclusions, but they didn't do anything wrong. Um, Um, so then that leads to Popper's alternative, right? So here, the, the demarcation problem, and again, the reason I'm saying that this can't be a direct critique of Carnap is because Carnap isn't really interested in that demarcation problem. But here, the answer to the demarcation problem was just like scientific theories are the ones that are right. <laughs> Um, they've been formed by correct exercises and in induction, and so they're very, very probably right. Or, at worst, will be shown to be special cases of a larger generalization. Um, so when we reject that answer to the demarcation problem, and uh, then the question is, well, okay, what is modern science and why is it so successful? And um, Popper's new answer is that what characterizes um, some activity that some people are doing as science is not that they have some rudimentary version of our theory. Because our theory, that is the one we've accepted for now, is just a guess anyway. It's not justified at all. <laughs> so it's, that's not what makes them scientific. We shouldn't expect that. What makes them scientific is that they have the right methodology. That is, that whatever theory it is they believe, and whatever it is, they don't have justification for it. But whatever universal statements they, they believe, um, they're, you know, uh, prepared and indeed, like, uh, enthusiastic about uh, subjecting them to severe tests. So when we find people doing that, we can say they're doing science, no matter how outlandish their beliefs happen to be. Um, um, Right, and again, I mean, you can see this in Popper's views about the history of Marxism, that, you know, he doesn't think that Marx's original views are more true than the view of 20th century Marxists, but he thinks that Marx's original views or Marx's original position is more scientific than theirs because he's making predictions that... Um, could in principle falsify his theory, whereas they are not uh, prepared to accept anything as falsifying the theory. Um, and again, like I don't, I, I don't, I frankly don't know enough about the history of Marxism to say what there is uh, to said for his interpretation, or you know. But uh, so I'm just using that as an example to see what Popper thinks. All right. So, um, okay, so that's Popper's alternative, but Kuhn also rejects this alternative. And why? Um, well, first of all, he points out that um, what characterizes, characterizes mature sciences, and what are the mature sciences? So, I mean, the, it's basically... Kuhn thinks that the sciences that are now mature are the physical sciences and at least in part the life sciences and that the social sciences are more problematic. And I think Popper agrees with that. As opposed to Carnap, who thinks that the social sciences are fine and wants to include them in his system. He, right, okay. So again, Kuhn and Popper are on the same side about this. But um, what Kuhn says, what is it that characterizes those mature sciences? Well, he says, you know, it's a certain kind of consensus. Now, I mean, it's not obviously a consensus in the sense that everyone agrees with everyone else about everything. 
Um, but it's a consensus about something, a lot of things, a lot of very fundamental things. Um, and, you know, Kuhn gives different lists of what these things are at different points, but they include, let's say, fundamental theories, especially the theories you might think of as metaphysical, um, experimental methods, uh, um, normal types of instrumentation and what they're used for, um, a whole range of things you know what are what questions are promising to work on is also an important one um, there's uh, an overall consensus about that in the mature science and uh, therefore the mature science is not divided into schools um, right there can be controversial issues but they get settled or if they can't be settled, they get left aside as problems for future work. They don't turn into institutions where one side is defending one view and the other side is defending the other view. Um, and I, I, I think it's true that that is uh, characteristic largely characteristic of the physical sciences and of some parts of the life sciences. It's not as true in evolutionary biology, for example. Um, okay, well, um, uh, which, I mean, I think Kuhn probably would agree with what I just said about ev evolutionary biology. Um, So, um, so consensus, of course, in some way, this is part of what Carnap identifies as characteristic of science or scientific questions, um, the, uh, namely that metaphysical questions, because they don't prescribe any empirical task of answering them, are just lead to endless dispute. Um, Whereas empirical scientific questions can be settled in principle. Um, however, again, uh, Carnap, when he says that consensus in that way is what characterizes scientific statements, is not including just the statements of the physical sciences, is including any statement that is not meaningless. Um, so, but in any case, point, so pointing out to this feature of the mature sciences is not a direct um, problem for Carnap. Now, it's not a direct problem for Popper either, because um, Popper, as far as I can see, doesn't ever exactly explain why the decision to accept a given theory or a given basic statement isn't just a personal decision. I mean, uh, um, I guess, I mean, he definitely does assume that it's not just a personal decision. Right, that his description of progress in science and so forth, you know, um, takes for granted that scientists are going to ag agree about when to accept theories and when to accept certain basic statements. Um, but he doesn't explain that there's something about science that makes that particularly likely to happen. On, you know, on the contrary, the fact that these decisions have to be made. Um, um, have to themselves be made on methodological grounds, which are basically like ethical grounds, might lead you to expect that there would be a lot of disagreement. Um, but um, in any case, uh, and, and he certainly doesn't say anything about the political structure that might be needed to ensure that these decisions are more than personal. Like, how are these disagreements that you might think were, are, are obviously going to 
crop up in science as he describes it, how are they going to be settled? Right? So, like, you know, if you, if, if you think that uh, science is governed by a methodology, which you might call the law of nature or the law of reason, um, then uh, you might expect that even although even though it's binding in the state of nature, right, where there's no way of enforcing a particular decision as to what that law demands, but it's just up to everyone to decide, even though it's binding in that state, that state will be very inconvenient because it will be hard for people to uh, coordinate in any way. Right, like I won't be able to allow to rely on other people's research reports if I don't, if I can't assume that we agree what basic statements should be accepted. Um, for people who are in 144, you should probably hear an allusion to Locke there. Um, and I think it's, you know, um, one of the things I pointed out recently, I don't think I said this in lecture, I think I said it in a Facebook post. But that, you know, wherever Popper says, we must guess, you, you could imagine that instead he would say, as Locke does, we must appeal to heaven, <laughs> right? Like force will have to decide or something like that. We have to have faith that the right side will, will win. Um, so, uh, right, so he doesn't say anything about that. Um, Lakatosh. Uh, I don't know if people paid attention to this in Lakatosh, but, you know, um, he rephrases Popper's criterion of demarcation by inserting this little political thing in it. He says, you know, um, the jury of science will have to decide unanimously to, to accept the theory or to drop the theory to reject the theory, to accept the basic statement or not. And then he adds, if the agreement is less than unanimous, then we may have to dismiss the people who won't agree as cranks. Right? Which, I mean, does happen in the history of science. Right? Like, Big Bang cosmology, um, or even uh, the uh, theory that quasars are very distant, very bright objects. So, you know, at some time this, there was controversy about whether these were the right ways of, of accounting for things, um, but that controversy was decided in effect at some point. And after that, all cosmologists were working within what Kuhn would call the paradigm of Big Bang cosmology, except a few who kept arguing. No, that, you know, look, I can still explain the data without assuming this crazy Big Bang that you all believe in. And those people, you know, I don't, they're probably not still around now, but they were still around when I was in grad school in astrophysics a long time ago. And, you know, they weren't fired or anything, but they, they still even published sometimes, but everyone ignored them and they didn't have any students. And, you know, they were cranks. They didn't start out as cranks, but by refusing to go along with the consensus, that's, they, that's what happened to them. So, um, Right, so Popper doesn't discuss any of that stuff. Um, um, and the fact that he doesn't is, is, is a problem for him. But, um, uh, but beyond that general problem of what, you know, what Popper should say something about this, um, Kuhn, I think, thinks he has a reason why what Popper said about it, says about it, can't be satisfactory, whatever it is. And this is, um, um, it says here at the bottom of page three, 
First, at least in order of presentation, is the insufficiency of methodological directives by themselves to dictate a unique, unique substantive conclusion to many sorts of scientific questions. Right? What he's saying is that this consensus um, can't be reached just by following everyone following the same methodology. Now, I mean, at this point in the book, he just tells you that. He just asserts that. Um, but he, he's saying that he, he thinks that historical data show that, right? That, that um, there isn't any way to resolve um, certain types of fundamental disputes uh, by appealing to a common methodology. So, um, so if that's true, then um, that is, if what the mature sciences have, and also I guess um, this is also important, what Kuhn thinks is necessary to the kind of progress they make, right? They make progress because they're not divided into schools that are always arguing about the fundamentals with each other. And again, that does seem right, at least with respect to physical sciences, that something like that has happened when you compare them to Aristotelian physics. Um, so um, um, if, if the mature sciences are, are characterized by consensus, and essentially so, in that consensus is, what, is part of what gives them their special character, Right? The character that, as I keep saying, is behind the whole existence of such a thing as philosophy of science. What is this modern science that isn't philosophy, but that seems to be so successful? So, um, um, if consensus is part of the answer to that, and yet methodology can't explain cons consensus, right? Popper's alternative is methodology. even forgetting what the methodology is. That's a general version of Popper's alternative. If, me if correct methodology can't produce consensus, then correct methodology can't be the answer to the demarcation problem. So um, if it's not just correctness per se, that is correctness of your theory, that it's not a myth or an error or whatever, and it's not correct methodology that characterizes mature science, what is it? And this is where Kuhn introduces his answer, which is his famous answer, that mature science has a paradigm. Um, now, uh, this word paradigm is no notoriously uh, problematic in as Kuhn's usage of it. Um, and uh, that is, you know, it's one of the first things that you often will hear people say about Kuhn, that he uses paradigm in a lot of different ways in this book. Um, um, in general, it pays to be suspicious about notorious facts like that. <laughs> um, but in this case, at least, Kuhn himself does say, so this edition, uh, the, that is the edition I ordered, or the, the edition that you would find most places now, I think, of the structure of scientific revolutions has a postscript added in 1969. And in the postscript added in 1969, Kuhn himself admits that he used the word paradigm in two rather different ways throughout the book. Um, he calls them there, one of them, the sociological meaning of paradigm. And the sociological meaning of paradigm is basically that whole, as he says, constellation of shared 
assumptions, everything that this consensus is about. So it's about certain fundamental theories, but it's also about other things like, uh, you know, experimental procedures, instrument construction, all kinds of stuff. Um, so the paradigm is the name for that whole um, uh, framework of assumptions, shared procedures, etc., that constitute a particular research tradition. But then he also uses paradigm to mean, and this is the official definition on page 10 when he first introduces the word, he uses paradigm to mean an exemplary achievement, which somehow serves as a model for scientists going forward, right? So in that use of paradigm, like Newton's Principia would be uh, an example of a paradigm or M Newton's achievement in the Principia or something like that. Even that's a little bit vague, what the paradigm is. Um, so um, these, these things are related. Um, uh, you know, I mean, essentially, Kuhn says that the only way that, that someone can be, like, in, inducted into this consensus, like, educated, trained into it, is not by being told abstract principles, because there are no abstract principles that completely describe it. Instead, it's by being exposed to examples. This is how we do it. This is the theory. This is the kind of problems it solves. This is the way we approximate it. Here's the kind of experiment that it matches, you know, etc. cetera. Um, okay, so that's the basic introduce, introduction to what Kuhn is reacting against and, you know, what this view about paradigms is supposed to do. Are there questions about that so far? Um, okay, so what is it about these? By the way, I should say, so Kuhn admits those two different uses of paradigm, but it seems like there's more than two. Um, Sometimes he even he seems to say something like every culture has a paradigm or is a paradigm. Um, every cultural institution has a paradigm. Um, human perception involves a shared paradigm, <laughs> right? Those are obviously much broader uses of paradigm where they wouldn't help settling the demarcation problem. Um, and there's probably other uses as well. Uh, but um, I do think those two that Kuhn himself mentions and that are closely related, even though they're not the same thing, which is confusing, are the most important thing, uh, you know, the most important uses that, that point out the most important features of his view. So, you know, what is the what are the characteristics of paradigms that make them uh, that allow them to generate this kind of consensus. And Kuhn says right away that what's characteristic of them is their rigidity. Um, Right, he says, uh, oh, I'm to switch. So, right, basically, the sociological meaning of paradigm without the term yet being introduced is first introduced towards the bottom of page four. Effective research scarcely begins before a scientific community thinks it has acquired firm answers to questions like the following. What are the fundamental entities of which the universe is composed? How do these interact with each other and with the senses? 
what questions may, may be legitimately asked about such entities and what techniques employed in seeking solutions. At least in the mature sciences, answers or full substitutes for answers, right? Because um, again, it's not an explicit set of methodological principles that people learn. They learn by example. But in any case, full or full substitutes for answers to questions like these are firmly embedded in the educational initiation that prepares and licenses the student for professional practice. Because that education is both rigorous and rigid, these answers come to exert a deep hold on the scientific mind. The, the paradigm because uh, the education that introduces the paradigm is rigid, the paradigm is rigid. It's not introduced through a process that allows critical engagement. Um, um, there is a, a student is not welcomed to ask whether uh, we're right to have this, to think that we have firm answers to these questions. Again, I have to say, based on my own experience in scientific education, um, there's a lot of truth to that. Um, Kuhn himself apparently found it oppressive. Sometimes he uses the word oppressive to describe scientific education. Um, I sometimes found it confusing. I don't know that I found it impressive, oppressive. But anyway, um, um, I found it unsatisfying, maybe. Is there a word I should use? Um, So in any case, this answer, that the thing that allows the paradigm to produce this uniform consensus on basic issues is its rigidity and the rigidity and uncritical nature of the education by which it's introduced. Obviously, at this point, we're in direct confrontation with Popper. Um, And again, the reason we're rejecting Popper is because um, Kuhn says, um, when you look into what scientists are doing in order to try to determine the rules of the game of what they're doing, um, and the rules of the game would be what Popper calls methodology, Um, you find that um, although it's easy to find what he calls paradigms, shared assumptions, exemplary achievements, whatever, it's very difficult to find rules that everyone agrees on, that everyone is following. Um, so... Uh, How does this fit together with the other answer that I just said about how the methodolog methodological agreement is not sufficient? Seem almost opposite. Just notice that now. All right, I'll have to think about that more. But in any case, um, Um, right, he points out and again this is very true I think though many scientists talk easily and well about the particular individual hypotheses that underlie a concrete piece of current research um, 
They are little better than laymen at characterizing the established bases of their field, its legitimate problems and methods. If they have learned such abstractions at all, they show it mainly through their ability to do successful research. Maybe I'm misunderstanding what he means by the insufficiency of methodology to account for. It's not that they all have the same methodology, but that's not enough to explain the consensus. But that does seem sound like what he's saying in the first two pages. Well, anyway, it's not that they don't they all agree on methodology, but they you know, but it's not sufficient to explain the the extent of the consensus between them. Well, maybe it's maybe these are the same thing. They do agree explicitly on methodology to a certain extent, but that agreement is not sufficient to explain what they're all doing together. Yeah, maybe that's, I guess, okay, I guess that's the way it goes together. So, um, um, right, and that's why when you ask them, what are you working on now? They can give you a long explanation of, well, you know, we're measuring the brightness of such and such in order to use it as a distance scale because we want to measure the Hubble constant and blah, 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 blah. Um, but if you ask them, what is physics? What makes something a physical problem? Um, you know, uh, um, uh, even maybe a lot of times if you ask them something like, why should I believe the Big Bang Theory? I don't know. I know answers to that question. So maybe, well, it's hard to say. But in any case, um, <clears throat> um, if you ask them these kind of fundamental questions about the consensus that makes the whole field go on and not split up into into schools, they they um, have, seem to have never thought of it before and don't have a really good answer, um, and they don't all have the same answer. So. Um, um, Therefore, it seems that it isn't some kind of methodological principles that they explicitly know that explain how they're able to all keep together. Now, you might claim, oh, there must be some principles that they, they, they unconsciously have assimilated or something like that. But Kuhn says um, there's no reason to think that. Right? That's the last sentence here. That ability can, however, be understood without recourse to hypothetical rules of the game. Um, so the conclusion here, and this conclusion goes radically against Popper, is that um, Scientists are not united in rationally accepting a hypothesis, in rationally uh, being prepared to test it in certain ways. Um, uh, you know, an education in that would have to be critical and open. Um, people who had that kind of education would be able to talk to you about uh, why they. Um, are all accepting this hypothesis for now, um, uh, even though it's not justified, etc. Um, instead, Kuhn says uh, scientists accept paradigms without question, rigidly. And um, the process of what Kuhn calls normal science, 
consists of scientists doing work subject to such to a rigid, unquestioned, fundamental consensus like the one he's talking about, reinforced in each new generation by textbooks and uh, so forth. And normal science, um, I think, and, uh, and Popper also thinks, by the way, so I'm going to read a little bit from Popper's response in a moment. Normal science is the really strange or shocking thesis of this book, the description of normal science, that scientists are not tr looking for unexpected results, that scientists are not trying to falsify anything, that, um, um, that scientists are proceeding, are, as Kuhn puts it, trying to stuff nature into their preordained conceptual boxes, right? This is the thing that makes Kuhn a radical departure from Popper and anything like Popper. Um, and then the other part of the book, when normal science stops temporarily, right, Kuhn mostly seems to think, although then there seems to be a few places where he describes an exception to this, but Kuhn mostly thinks to think, seems to think that once a field becomes mature, crosses that line, says to maturity it never goes back permanently um, unless maybe it completely ceases to exist um, right so a revolution happens when normal science is temporarily suspended the paradigm is put in that people have been working under up until that is put into question there's a period of chaotic uh, hum, uh, hum. Kuhn calls it extraordinary science, um, which results eventually in establishing a new paradigm. And then we go back to normal science. So this part, revolution, um, you know, and for good reason, after all, it's what the book says in its title, Structure of Scientific Revolutions. A lot of people have thought that the radical thesis of the book must be in here. Um, but from my perspective, and I think also from the perspective of Popperians, um, this part is um, secondary, and what it's mostly aimed to do is to, the discussion of scientific revolutions in the book is mostly aimed to show that even in this period when normal science is suspended, scientists don't act the way Popper would, would predict they should act, right? It's not like here they're just going along following this paradigm following a routine unquestioningly, and now something wakes them up and they do some rational science with good Popperian methodology until they settle on a new paradigm or something like that. Kuhn wants to show in detail that what happens in a revolution can't be explained that way. And that's the importance of this part. So I, it is important, it's very important, but it draws its importance from the importance of the other part about normal science, I think. Um, um, okay, so as a question, I don't know where this came in. Can a paradigm also be a theory? It seems like they may be different, but some of the examples of paradigm Kuhn's gives could also be called theories. For example, relativity. Yeah, that's a good question. So a paradigm, um, so when Kuhn first introduces paradigm, it seems like a sort of an alternative to the term theory. Right, like Popper's history of science would be a Popper of scientists accepting and rejecting theories, whereas Kuhn's history of science will be a, of accepting and rejecting paradigms. Um, but a paradigm does, and a paradigm directs you how to theorize. 
So certain theories arise under the paradigm, but he also, um, at least in some examples, and you know, probably in his main examples, like Newtonian physics or relativity, um, will say that there's a theory that characterizes the paradigm, the paradigm theory, he often calls it. Sometimes, another use of the word paradigm, he even seems to use paradigm just to mean that theory. Um, but, um, and in the 1969 postscript, he kind of says, you know, the theory what was is what was really important. That postscript, by the way, I have to say is like, it's interesting, but the, the status of it is questionable in my mind. It's, it, it, it seems to me sometimes like he's deliberately going back and, and, um, like revising, um, in some ways making less radical, for one thing, the things that he said originally in the book. So, uh, but in any case, yeah, so uh, there were, there's some relationship between certain theories and paradigms, but it's a little bit ambiguous. And that's, I guess, the best I can say about it for the moment. That's, that's a good question, though. Um, Okay, so um, so like Kuhn's description of normal science, oh, by the way, let me add one more thing about revolutions. So what happens in a revolution is a radical kind of conceptual change um, such that Kuhn will say, this is another famous one of his terms that hasn't come up yet, that the the people after the revolution are speaking an incommensurable language or using concepts that are incommensurable with the pre the old paradigm the pre revolution people um, um, from popper's point of view that doesn't make any sense remember i kept emphasizing how like Popper thinks science is about statements, not about the concepts that are used in statements. Words don't matter, Popper keeps saying. Concepts don't matter. What matters is what things you use them to say and how you mean those things, right? Like what kind of tests you're willing to accept or whatever. Um, uh, from uh, Carnap's point of view, however, that um, incommensurability is not really a big problem. I, th I think, you know, I think Carnap can pretty well agree that certain kinds of experiences would, uh, in the terminology of the Aufbau, would call for um, constituting different concepts, perhaps even from the ground up. Um, so Carnap might actually expect that a scientific revolution could involve um, a new set of concepts that can't be translated one-to-one -one into the old ones. That's basically what the, it's such that the statements using the new ones can't be translated one-to-one -one into the statements using the old ones. And certainly Quine is fine with that. Right? That's what he says is always going on basically. Um, so again, this is specifically a problem for, for Popper, really. Um, but again, I think it's a problem because of what's on each side of it. That's why revolutions do have to do what Kuhn says they have to do. They have to change from one set of rigid conceptual boxes to another one. Um, so anyway, getting back to what's going on in normal science. So Kuhn and Popper actually agree about a lot here. I mean, they agree that science can't go on just by collecting random observations. 
some later philosophers of science like Ian Hacking, uh, you know, tried to cast doubt on that. But, um, but Kuhn and Popper are agreed. Remember Popper had that thing about imagine being given the direction, sit in a room and write down everything you observe and how completely ambiguous that is, what kind of things are you supposed to write down? It's like impossible to follow that direction. Um, so, you know, a lot of the things that Kuhn says in chapter three on the nature of normal science are um, things that, from a certain point of view, Popper would expect. But you can only make observations in the, if you have already have accepted a certain theory. Um, but again, the, the question is, what are you trying to use those observations to do? Um, so Popper says, you're trying to use, so, so Popper says you have to accept a theory. Psychologically meaning, speaking, that means you're going to believe the theory. Methodologically meaning, speaking, however, it means you're going to use the theory to try to falsify itself. Right? You're going to look for places where the theory says something that you're not sure is true but that empirical experiments could determine whether it's true, and then you're going to go out and do those experiments. Because you hope that one of those experiments will show that the theory is wrong, and then you're making progress. So Kuhn's whole discussion of normal science in chapter 3, and it's very long and complicated, um, um, is uh, um, aimed at, like, it's very long and complicated because he wants to give what he sees as a complete catalog of the different types of observational and theoretical work that normal scientists carry out um, and show that none of it aims at what Popper says it should aim. Um, and in summary, he says none, none of it aims at um, uncovering fundamental novelty, unexpected results. So what does it aim at? Now, as I said, it's long and complicated. In the past, I've probably, this is one of these things where, as Kierkegaard says, you'll regret it either way. Um, so in the past, I've tried to go into that long list of different activities he gives. There's basically three kinds of activities. Um, one is uh, like um, making observation or theory more precise. Another is um, finding a group, finding places where the theory can be shown to agree with reality, that is, with observations. And a third one is what, he, that's the hardest one to understand, is what he calls articulation of the paradigm. Which, but um, all of these put together are aimed not at finding anything unexpected, according to Kuhn. They're, they're aimed at... Um, adjusting the data and the theory until they agree with each other. Because you know that they have to agree with each other. Everyone knows. If you know, if you are unable to get yourself to believe that or whatever, or if you were too resistant to that, then you didn't get a PhD in whatever science this is. So, uh, you know, except for some cranks, uh, who everyone ignores, everyone knows that um, this has to work, right? So, like, you know, everyone knows what explains planetary orbits. And the question is, um, but, but the question is not, 
it's not, this is not an easy problem. This is something that, that Putnam emphasizes, and in, in part, he's drawing on Kuhn, right? Remember, he talks about Kuhn at the end of the uh, corroboration of theories. Um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's one thing to say that, in principle, the orbit of Uranus has to be must be explained somehow by applying the universal theory of gravitation. But it's another thing to figure out exactly how to do it. It's not necessarily easy. Like the thing about, oh, it can be explained by adding a new planet at such and such position in such and such a time in such and such an orbit is like not at all easy to figure out. Um, it took like really difficult theoretical mathematical work to bring that about. And, you know, then also uh, it required very precise instruments to uh, check that that was the right solution. Right? I mean, you can't see Neptune with your naked eyes. I don't know if you could see Neptune with Galileo's telescope even. Um, it's not very bright. <laughs> uh, so uh, um, all kinds of really careful work had to be done to go from everyone knows there must be an explanation of such and such a kind to actually having the explanation. Um, and like all the other examples that Kuhn discusses are like that in one way or another. Um, People are trying to measure something that, that trying to measure a constant that the paradigm says must be constant. Everyone knows there is such a constant, but measuring it is really difficult. Um, it may be hard to even think of the apparatus that could measure it. Right? He mentions the measuring the the constant capital G in Newton's. Uh, the use of symbols in, in science and mathematics is an interesting area, but not one that any of these people discuss, so I won't discuss it. <laughs> um, but anyway, the, the constant that we usually call capital G, because that's the letter that's always used to write it, um, in Newton's theory of gravitation, um, it's very, very small, right? It's the, like, what is the force between this pen and this eraser? They're very close to each other, much closer together than the Earth and the Moon or whatever. What is the gravitational force between them? Well, it's, you know, completely negligible. Um, how could you possibly measure such a small, small thing? Well, you know, eventually people figured out very sensitive experiments and were able to measure it. Um, and now people have even tried to do experiments. This is still difficult. I'm not sure at what stage this is, but to actually like verify that uh, electrons and positrons, you know, respond to gravitational fields in exactly the same way, like measuring the trajectory of an individual particle, <laughs> um, right? So, but this type of experiment is very, very difficult. Everyone knows it must have an answer, but getting to the answer is really hard. And Kuhn says that's what people are doing in normal science. They're trying to stuff nature into the conceptual boxes, but the conceptual boxes are very rigid. The things that you're allowed to do to stuff them are very tightly prescribed, not by explicit rules that everyone knows, although that's part of it, but also by things that go beyond that. Like just everyone knows what kind of approach makes sense. Um, so um, this, this stuffing into conceptual, conceptual boxes, which might, like from a certain point of view, this sounds like the lazy way out, right? Like I'm not going to let my theory be challenged by anything, right? Like conventionalism is Popper presents as such a lazy way out. I'm going to define my concepts in advance in such a way that everything, that things will have to go into them. Kuhn is saying, no, that's not what scientists are doing at all. They are trying to solve a really, really difficult 
problem of how to stuff things into these boxes. There's a lot of work to do. Um, still, you might ask, well, why do this work, however? And I mean, I think that question becomes particularly acute when you compare it to what to things people do who are not doing science. So let's move this here. Um, Okay, um, only in the earlier pre-paradigm stages of development, so here he's talking about a specific issue, whether people write books that are supposed to be intelligible to a broad, relatively broad audience, or whether they communicate in short, esoteric journal articles. So only in the earlier pre-paradigm stages of the development of the various sciences did the book ordinarily possess the same relation to professional achievement that it still retains in other creative fields. So this is a phrase that crops up a lot in this book. Um, science, Kuhn is always comparing science to other creative fields. Other creative fields, so in other words, like again, what is the demarcation problem supposed to be between? <laughs> right, for Popper, I said, well, you know, the it's supposed to rule out some things that he thinks are fine, like methodology, metaphysics of certain kinds at least, mathematics. Um, uh, it's The demarcation is supposed to include certain things in addition to what you might normally call science, like technology, engineering, whatever. And the thing it's really supposed to exclude is pseudoscience. So for Kuhn, the demarcation is supposed to exclude all these other quote-unquote creative fields, which include, first of all, you know, um, now engineering is going to go outside. Right? He keeps saying about certain problems that scientists are not interested in them, and he leaves them, they leave them to engineers. I don't think that's really logical. What happened to my gravitational? Engineering goes out here, but definitely also art, um, history. And we don't know exactly what else, but creative fields. Um, so, um, in other creative fields, they don't have a paradigm. So they do divide into schools. Now, does that happen in engineering? Hmm. Not sure what he would say about that. Um, but, uh, um, and so, um, their education is not so rigid. And so they are sometimes interested in fundamental novelty. Um, And you might think to yourself, well, gee, that sounds better. 
<laughs> right? I mean, uh, maybe, you know, what is, is maturity actually such a good thing? Um, so it's not at all clear what Kuhn's answer to that is. I just want to say that right away. Um, he is describing what makes science the way it is and gives it the special characteristics that it has. He does say that it's sometimes useful, but he doesn't really explain why it's sometimes useful. Um, he, in a sense, he seems to have even less explanation for that than Popper does. Why we should expect an activity like this to be useful. And like he said, he, you know, uh, he explicitly rules out any direct applications or usefulness as part of science. Um, and he himself left science, apparently because he found it oppressive, although I don't think he ever says that explicitly anywhere, and he may even deny it somewhere, but I still think it's true. Um, so, um, um, he may not be, the moral of this book may not be do this. Um, now, I mean, you might ask, well, why doesn't he then write a, 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 a book encouraging people not to do that? And I think, you know, that's a question about what he thinks rational argument can do in general, in politics, let's say, broadly speaking. Right. So, I mean, I, we're going to come back to that, but there's possible answers to that. I just want to read um, briefly from Popper's response to Kuhn. So this is um, In the bottom of page 1145 in the proper volume, in case you ever want to buy it. <laughs> um, so, uh, I am prepared to admit now, following Kuhn, the existence of routines in science, and thus the existence of what he calls normal science. But I think that the very idea of a routine is uncharacteristic of science, and consequently, that normal science is not normal, but uncharacteristic, right? Quote, unquote, normal science is not normal, but uncharacteristic. I think that the phenomenon of a routine in science has become more prominent only recently. So he's disagreeing with Kuhn's history of science, um, along with the mass production of scientists. And I think that Kuhn is projecting comparatively recent phenomenon, which he has personally experienced, not only upon earlier periods, but upon the whole long history of science. And then a little bit farther down, Popper says, that routine plays such a role in our century as to be explained by the sudden need for huge numbers of trained technologists, a consequence of the modern armaments race, perhaps. Right, so he blames it on the military industrial complex, which is interesting. Um, so in any case, right, K K Popper says, well, you're right, Kuhn, you've opened my eyes to this. Scientists are doing something what, like what you say they're doing, but I'm sticking to my guns. They shouldn't do that. And he still has to add, and they didn't usually do that. Because if he had, again, as I pointed out before, if Popper admits that Newton and Einstein and Darwin and whatever, the, the, the paradigmatic scientists, if he admits that they weren't following his methodology, then his demarcation problem won't be about anything interesting, right? So, so and that's why I kept saying that, that you know, Kuhn is going to show that Popper actually is vulnerable to a certain kind of attack based on the actual history of science. And Kuhn is the one who's mounting that attack.
So which one is right about the history of science? Uh, I'm not really sure. History is a field where it's notoriously difficult to reach a consist consensus, even about fundamentals. <laughs> Um, uh, in fact, history is characterized by waves of revisionism, re revisionism, right? So, uh, like trying to get an answer out of historians to a question is, um, in some ways, kind of fruitless. Um, the next generation are going to say that the answer you got was wrong. But anyway, yes, it may. Um, so, uh, but you know, that I think that quote also, I think, demonstrates what I keep saying about Popper that from Popper's point of view, this is the radical part of the book the description of normal science, not the part about revolutions. Okay, so. Um, so I just so I just sort of address the question: Why do this then? Right, where if the question were as Hume would would put it, you know, how can Kuhn recommend this practice to us? Um, the answer is maybe he can't. But that still leaves a different question, which is why do scientists actually do it? And this is where um, puzzle solving comes in. I don't know where to write this, but maybe right here. What do you call a really difficult problem that you know the solution, you know what the solution to it will be like, but the hard part is to get such a solution? Well, Kuhn says, you call that a puzzle, right? Like, so for example, if you have a jigsaw puzzle, um, you're not attempting to discover any unexpected result. On the contrary, usually when you, I mean, there's some that are super hard that don't have this, but usually when you buy a jigsaw puzzle, it comes in a box with a picture of what you're going to get when you're done on the box, right? So you know exactly what you're going to get. Um, but the question is how to get there. And you're not allowed to do just anything to get there. You have to fit the pieces together, et cetera, in the, in the right way. You can't force them, you know, et cetera, as Kuhn goes through some of those rules, which, again, you know, it's interesting. Those rules of jigsaw puzzle solving, I wonder if they're written out anywhere other than in Kuhn's summary here. You're not allowed to turn the pieces over, you know, et cetera. Um, anyway, uh, um, so why do people do that? Why do people do jigsaw puzzles? Um, the result isn't useful. Um, the result isn't necessarily the most interesting or best thing you could do with these puzzle pieces. Right? So Kuhn says, and this is one of the most interesting passages in the book, I think. This is on page, uh, oops. Thirty eight, maybe. Oh. Yes, page thirty eight. Either a child or a contemporary artist could do that. Sorry, to solve a jigsaw puzzle is not, for example, merely to make a picture. So, so far the point is just that there are rules to it, right? Either a child or a contemporary artist could do that by scattering selected pieces as abstract shapes upon some neutral ground. 
the picture thus produced might be far better and would certainly be more original than the one from which the puzzle had been made, right? So in that sentence, he adds something more than just, um, you can't just do it anyway. He adds, and by the way, you may, maybe you can't do it in the best way, <laughs> right? Like maybe the picture that the child or abstract artist he says something about the history of art later, which will be worth paying attention to in this connection. The child or the abstract artist would use these same pieces, ignoring the rules, to make a better picture. So the creative field that they're involved in, the child or the abstract artist, it's immature, right? That's why the child is doing it. It's immature. Um, oh, I don't know if I ever switched to that. Oops. All right, never mind. I can't get it. All right. Um, um, I train of thought, and I'm out of time. Um, right, they're, the creative field that they're contributing to may be more creative. I guess it's, it's certainly more creative and maybe better <laughs> than, the, than the creative field so-called that the jigsaw puzzle is contributing to, which creates nothing but jig, solved jigsaw puzzles. So why do people do that? What would be a good reason to do that? And Kuhn says basically, well, there is no good reason. I mean, it's a kind of test of your skill. Yes, maybe that's you like to test your skill, but that might be a reason to solve one jigsaw puzzle. Why do you keep doing it over and over? And Kuhn says you're addicted, right? He uses the term addicted. So he says scientists do normal science because they're addicts. They don't. They had some reason they were interested in to begin with, but they've gotten hooked on this puzzle solving activity and they can't stop. Um, and so like, this is the really the crux of, of Kuhn's rejection of everything that Popper sees in science. For, for, for Popper, science is the locus of human freedom and responsibility um, and rationality. Um, and he understands that in roughly speaking Kantian terms. And uh, Kuhn says that um, science is unfreedom. It's at least normal science is unfreedom. It's addiction. Um, it's using yourself as a means and not also as an end. Okay, that's, sorry, I'm already over time, so that's definitely all I have time for. And uh, we'll see you on Thursday.